Near my house, there is a cemetery. I remember as a young boy, I would go there with bread to feed the geese that resided there. I stopped going to feed the geese several years ago due to the fact that feeding the geese is not permitted anymore. But that was not the reason that I stopped going to the cemetery. My parents forbade me from going back after I told them the story. About the tree man. The tree man is what my parents said it was nothing but an imaginary friend. But the tree man is real. One day I was walking my dog. We went walking in the cemetery around sundown, and since it was summer, I walked my dog for quite a while. My dog was rather athletic, so we walked for about an hour or so. It was getting dark, and me being a young child, I was afraid of the dark. And my dog was getting tired, so I walked toward my house. But all of a sudden, my dog bolted for the woods. It was very unlike him. Me and my dog had been inseparable since he was just a puppy. He would never leave me unless he thought something meant harm to me. I chased after him. Achilles! Come here! I shouted. I heard barking in the distance. I followed the sound of barking until I found him growling at a man who looked like he was completely made of tree roots. His entire body was made of wood. The tree man handed me my dog's leash. I said what I learned was the right thing to say. Thank you. He nodded and waved as I walked off. His fingers were elongated and sharp. He was incredibly creepy looking. He had bones and veins made of root. And he had no feet. Only a massive tangled root system below his lower body. He was held up by vines tied to a tree. He was very creepy looking, but he never scared me. He never talked. He didn't have to. I knew what he wanted. He seems like he would just want to see me at first, but then he started to say things audibly to me like, What's it like? To walk, would you let me be you for a day, or don't you want to be like me? When I told my parents about the tree man, they immediately forbade me from going into the cemetery to see him. And the tree man was just remembered as a creepy imaginary friend. I think that there was something evil in that tree that wanted to trap me inside it to become just like him. I see it now every time I walk outside. The tree man is waving at me from the edge of the woods. There's a legend in this town. A legend about the deer woman. She was apparently a little girl who had a fascination with deer. So much so that everything she did revolved around the deer she saw. She named them 
forged with them, even slept with them in the woods. She was rather obsessed. After she spent a week in the woods, her parents called the police. They found her drinking water from the lake. It was discussed that she be taken to a mental institution, but her parents refused to have her committed. They were convinced that she just needed a different hobby or something. They refused to acknowledge that she had a real problem. She was forbidden to go into the woods by her parents, but as little children tend to do, she found a way out and went into the woods anyway. And this time, she didn't want to be found. She would go out in the woods, be found within a few days, and then be sent back to her parents' house where they pleaded with her to find a new hobby. But she never got a new hobby. She would always find out of sheer chance she had never been in the woods during hunting season. Until she was a teenager. By this point she had gotten very crafty in her ways to get out of the house. Most people think she used the air vent in her room to get to the cellar which led her outside. But no one really knows for sure. It was late night or early morning, depending on how you want to look at it, and hunters began to make their way into the woods as the girl made her way to her most beloved deer. That day, as she was drinking some water, she heard footsteps. She assumed that it was the police and dove into the murky lake so that she would not be seen. But rather than hear muffled shouting, she heard a muffled bang. Frightened, she swam upwards, still trying to conceal herself in the water. What she saw broke her heart. Hunters had shot one of the deer, one of her most beloved deer, one that she had followed since it was only a newborn fawn. The hunters took her away. The girl cried all night, but eventually her sadness gave way to pure anger. She wanted to make them pay. That night, she snuck into the hunter's camp and found her deer, her friend, being cooked. This only fueled her anger. In that moment of rage, she snapped the deer's antlers off and stabbed the hunters to death with them. The police found her crying over the deer the next day. They threw her into an asylum this time. She was now considered criminally insane. Her parents had no say in the matter this time. But to everyone's horror, she had escaped the very next day. Harold went with his soon-to-be in-laws out in the woods for deer hunting. He was not a hunter himself, but his fiancée said it would be a good way to get to know his new brother and father-in-law. They spent all day looking for deer and they had finally shot one or two. It was late by this time, so they made camp by the lake. That night, Harold escaped with his life. His testimony to the police station stated that a woman with antlers killed his brother and father-in-law and nearly killed him. Immediately, they knew it was the deer woman. They caught the girl and put her back into the asylum. But yet again, she escaped. And this time, she wasn't found. And since then, there's been a law put in place to never kill deer in the area. Some hunters still do. And they are found weeks later killed by the deer woman. She has been known to follow hunters into the city. The following is a picture that was taken by one of her victims moments before his demise. If you live in a decent sized city, you may find yourself walking down an old road. Nothing but trees will be around it. When you notice this, it will be your last chance to turn back. And you can do so with no repercussions, other than wondering what you may have been able to gain. But if you are a risk taker, 
and you are brave, continue walking. If you are driving a car in the beginning of your journey, it'll break down at some point. As you walk, you will begin to put into fatigue quickly. You'll see houses around. Do not go in them. They will trick you, thinking that they are your destination. But they offer you a false finish to your race. You will walk for what seems like years. There will be other trails, but you must stay on the one you are on. Eventually, voices will come. They will first tempt you to veer off your path, then beg, then threaten. You must remain strong. You must not give in to the voices. If you do, it will be your demise. You cannot stop and rest. If you do, you'll fall prey to temptation and stay there on that part of the road for the rest of your days. Keep walking. Never stop. Not even for a moment. You will feel you have walked around the world a hundred times before finally beginning to make out something in the distance. It is a man. Do not fear him. He will give you the true respite. Your prize for your devotion to walking the trail. He will be dressed in a cloak, and his face will be shrouded in shadows. He stands tall, almost impossibly so. As you walk closer, relief will wash over you in waves, and you will feel that your journey that has lasted what seems like ages is finally complete. As as you approach him, stand in front of him, he will ask you one question. Do you accept the gift that I offer? Answer yes. And from now on, no matter what you do, you will succeed in it. Should you ever be in danger, the hooded man will come to your aid, and you will have immortality. But you must accept the man's gift. Today was just an ordinary day. I went to school. I did my work and went home. I had been getting tired of this day in, day out routine. I wanted something different. Something exciting. Well, I got my wish when an old friend of mine texted me telling me to meet him at the old train station. The old train station? Why that place? It's falling apart and it's a known place for gang activity. Now, I'm no chicken, but... I wasn't about to be shot by some guy trying to close a drug deal. I tried to text him back saying, Why the old train station? Can't we meet somewhere safer? He replied, No. You must meet me there. You must see what I have. This really creeped me out, but against my better judgment, I went to the train station around sundown. I sat there and waited. I didn't see him until late that night. He ran out of the woods and motioned me to follow him. Not knowing what else to do, I followed him down the tracks. I was barely able to keep up with him. He finally just disappeared from my sight. I should have turned back. I should have gone home. But I didn't. I ran as fast as I could down the trail to try and find him. I ran until my lungs burned. And eventually I had to stop. My legs ached and burned. I was heavily winded. I couldn't even shout his name anymore. I looked around and noticed that all around me were destroyed and abandoned buildings. Had I... Had I wandered into a ghost town? I was really starting to get afraid. Something was wrong. I heard screaming and gunshots in the distance, and I hid in a nearby tree. I saw a few men chasing a woman, screaming at her in a foreign language, what I assumed to be Russian. Since I had been taking Russian, I could translate a bit of what they were saying. That will teach you to steal our food, they shouted as they hit her with the blunt side of his weapon. I couldn't let her be beaten. I had to do something. I... I killed them. I had no choice. The woman silently thanked me, and she ran away to what I hoped was a safe place. Where was I? 
I began to walk aimlessly around the city. Nothing around, just destroyed buildings, broken glass, and more soldiers. What was happening? I had to find out. I darted as fast as I could to the nearest abandoned building. Thank God no soldiers were inside. I searched the rooms, and I found a television. I tried to switch it on. Nothing. Should have known there'd be no electricity. The building was half destroyed by bullet holes. I found something laying there in the rubble. A newspaper clipping. America under siege. President dead. UN crumbles. Oh. Oh God. I'm... I'm in the future. That train track led me into the future. I have to get out. I have to make it back to the train tracks, and run as fast as I possibly could back to my time. As I ran, I found myself traveling into another... future? No. I know what I've done. The beast. It tricked me to suffer every possible future. Every way man's demise could come about. And I've noticed, every time, man brings upon his own demise, in search of conquest and power. I have been cursed to forever witness these tragedies. So I'm writing this, and letting the papers go in the wind. Whoever this gets to, please, please do not follow me. It's bad enough you have to suffer one apocalypse. And try not to spread violence. Every time you do, you bring your world's end ever so closer. My name is Isaac Moore. I have been chosen by my superior officers to go to a new planet and observe its day and night cycle as well as a good amount of other things, such as what the gravity is like and is there water. I won't bore you with the details, and I can't. Apparently this job is highly classified. After six months of being on the space station, I finally feel like a real astronaut. Apparently, I'll be sent alone. They feel it's too risky to send an entire team. Anyway, I'll be there for one entire Earth week. Also, the Admiral said to keep a voice log on what I see and feel every day. Anyway, I'm really excited for this. I'll be sent out to the planet in two hours. I better get ready. Day 1 I just arrived on the planet, and I gotta say, it's not what I expected. It looks like a red desert rather than cracked, dry ground. I decided now would be a good time to explore and get pictures, so I walked out, and the first thing I noticed is that the sand turns into some clay-like substance when pressure is applied to it. The second thing I noticed is that the planet has very harsh and drastic changes in the weather. One moment the sun was shining, and the next was a massive sandstorm. The sandstorm lasted quite a while, but it finally stopped, and I was able to explore a bit more. I didn't find much to report other than there seems to be some sort of atmosphere around this planet. However, I am not certain yet if oxygen is what resides in this atmosphere. It's still bright out, but I need my rest. It's been a long day. I can't wait to explore more tomorrow. Day 2 I woke up, and it was still bright out but the sandstorm had stopped completely and turned into a torrential downpour. I wasn't going to let rain stop me from exploring. It reminded me of home, running through the rain as a child. I saw something in the distance move out from the corner of my eyes, but when I turned to look, it was just a large stone that fell from the mountain. As I traveled further eastward, it began to get colder. Ice and snow covered everything. 
This was truly an amazing discovery. This means that the planet could be suitable for human life. It seemed the further east I went, the more civilized things looked. I saw structures that resembled igloos, and caves that were obviously not caused by nature due to their perfectly circular shape. I felt like I was being followed at points in my journey back to the base. Maybe it was just that rock that fell as well as the igloos. If anything was living here, it couldn't survive this bipolar weather. Right? I went back to base, and I won't lie, I was relieved to be back in a familiar place. I was about to report in to my superiors when I found there was no signal. This made me very uneasy. It was still bright out, but that wasn't the only reason I didn't sleep easy. I also heard strange noises coming from outside the spacecraft. Some sort of odd, gurgling noise. It was very unsettling. Day 3. I woke up, and it's starting to get darker outside. That gurgling sound around my shuttle was gone. I figured it was safe to head out again. Today, the sun was beating down on the planet, where the snow was yesterday. I could see things that were hidden in the ice now. There was smooth, solid rock with odd symbols etched onto it. It was definitely not natural. This was carved. There must be some sort of intelligent life in this planet. The gurgling sound returned, and I whipped around and saw something running from me. Like some sort of frightened animal. I followed it. I ran as fast as I possibly could. I looked around and I realized that where igloos once were are now small rock huts. I kept running and I saw it run into that cave. I was about to go in it, but I hesitated. I stopped. What if this thing was hostile? I knew that eventually I'd be driven there, but I wanted to postpone it as much as possible. I decided to investigate the odd rock huts. It had what I assume is this planet's version of a chair. It looked like an ordinary rocking chair, but the back of it looked a bit like a sextant. The other things were simply a bed and another odd looking chair. I took pictures all around the area and all around the cave entrance, but I still could not go in. As I headed back, this time I saw figures staring at me from the top of the hills. The gurgling sound could be heard at an almost deafening tone. Needless to say, I ran back into the shuttle as I desperately tried to contact the base, but to my horror, there were small, long-necked, humanoid creatures smashing the transmission system, while others screeched in approval. I'm not going back outside. I can't. Day 4. It's completely dark out. I didn't sleep a wink last night. I heard those things pounding against the door. I've been desperately trying to escape all day, but the shuttle's been programmed not to be allowed to take off until 7 days. I have to get out of here. The gurgling sounds sound like muffled English now. They want to get inside. They're scratching their knife-like claws against the metal. That horrible sound of metal on metal paralyzed me in fear, along with those horrible muffled voices. I can't sleep. I try to look outside. The creatures surround the shuttle as a dense fog blankets the beyond. I have to get off this planet.
Day 5. I hear the voices much clearer now. They continue to shout, Let me in. Over and over and over. They've stopped scratching the ship, but they continue to beat the walls and doors. I have done nothing but eat and desperately try to repair the transmission. I've come to the conclusion that these creatures are nocturnal and they feed upon metal and anything solid. My theory of this horrible planet is that these things emerged from the ground and ate all metallic alloys as well as the indigenous residents, which explains the clay like sand. They suck the metal from the very rocks. This place was once beautiful, possibly even modernly civilized, but when these things came and destroyed everything and everyone, these things brought about the end of this world. I have to get out of here, or they will destroy me too. Day 6. The dawn finally came. They retreated back to their caves and huts, to hide in the dark and feast upon the rock and metal they had salvaged. Against my better judgment, I snuck outside. I had to be sure they were gone, and that they had not caused enough damage to the craft to make it unflyable. To my horror, they had torn out the engine. It didn't take me long to find out where they had it. They had taken it to their cave, where they would eat it. I had to give it back. But how? They're all inside that cave, or near it. I'd have to try to lure them away, or somehow carry it all the way back. I'll have to sneak inside and try not to be seen. And I'll have to find the engine and take it back. Due to the fact that there is not much gravity on this planet, I should be able to carry it due to my calculations. I started walking until I reached the cave and began my journey. I needed a source of light. I had to turn on my night vision with my helmet. I walked as quietly as I could. I found no creatures. The cave looked to be ruins of some sort of architecture. It was beautiful. I took pictures. I also noticed the remains of former indigenous species. They looked almost like us. In fact, the only difference was their head it was in an oval shape. Tears welled up in my eyes as I saw the remains of people that were thousands, hundreds of thousands. I felt horrible, but I had to find that engine. I wouldn't want to end up like them. Hours passed, but I finally found it, and I began to drag it out of the cave when I noticed something. Those creatures staggered out of a door, walking towards me, growling. I froze in horror as they walked towards me, but then my instincts kicked in. I ran. I ran aimlessly through that cave for what seemed like forever, until I found my way out. Since it was bright out, but they didn't follow me, but they had done enough damage. They spit some sort of acidic compound that began to eat through my suit, and it was melting the skin right off of my arm and leg. I was somehow able to install the engine and lock the door, trying to control the bleeding. Day 7. I blacked out not long after I got in the ship. I awoke in an infirmary. I was back at the station. I was safe. My arm and leg were gone, but I was safe. I asked my superior what happened. They said that the shuttle fell apart as soon as it landed, and that I was lucky to be alive. They said they found a creature in the half-destroyed wing, and when they tried to approach it, it screeched and ran into the vents. 
And that's when the lights went out. I hear it calling me. It's coming for me. Everyone's dead. The station's falling apart. I'll be dead soon. If anyone is hearing this, do not attempt rescue. It's too late. You need to blow this place to smithereens. My name is Isaac Moore, astronaut on the Venus Alpha Space Station. Whoever this gets to, it is your responsibility to... <laughs>